Friends, we are starting now. Today is 195th Friday group meeting. Our uh, speaker is Mr. Sridhar Potrazu, a good friend. Uh, he addressed earlier also, I just announced. The topic is today's topic is rejection of plate as barred by limitation under Order 7, Rule 11, CPC. So, we specially requested uh, Sridhar out of the way he came and uh, and. Uh, First time we addressed on 71st Friday group meeting that is dated 2nd February 2018. The topic was uh, uh, Honorable Uttarakhand High Court judgment declaring reverse Ganga and Yamuna as juristic person that is a first summon 71. And after that, in 153rd also, he addressed us. The topic was uh, Indian magazines as a bridge between litigants and law that is his own book he, he was authored that it was uh, uh, preface written by uh, uh, Ram, Rama Subramanian just honorable judge supreme court now Sridhar you can initiate the amendment once 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 Good afternoon to all the learned senior members, colleagues, and Seshigiri sir, for giving me this opportunity to address the Friday group again. Today's topic is of uh, seminal importance for the entire uh, litigation and how it is conducted in the country, and it also has a direct bearing on the areas of matters pending across the country in various courts. The reason I say this is this. The Code of Civil Procedure has, in fact, empowered the trial courts to reject a vexatious or a frivolous plaint from proceeding further and occupying valuable judicial time and then multiple uh, uh, appeals and revisions at the interlocutory stage and the final stage. So that power has been conferred with a very legitimate end in mind. The legitimate end, as I see it, is regarding the adjudication of genuine disputes which arise between parties in accordance with the procedural safeguards and the evidence as governed by the laws applicable thereto. The law of limitation comes in which extinguishes the legal remedies, the rights under certain statutes or civil law may continue, but the remedies are barred under the Law of Limitation Act. So for the present discussion, I am going to confine myself on Order 7, Rule 11, CPC and the Limitation Act provisions would be relevant for us. The first provision which I would like to draw everyone's attention is Order 7, Rule 1. In fact, Rule 1 E speaks about the facts constituting the cause of action and when it arose. So therefore, cause of action is the root for a person to actually invoke the jurisdiction of a court seeking a remedy for the grievance that he has suffered on account of the actions or inactions of the defendants by institution of a plaint under the CPC. <coughs> Rule 1F speaks about the facts showing that the court has jurisdiction. So therefore, the Order 7 Rule 1 sets the tone on which Rule 11 has to be interpreted. So the plain as a matter of law requires to disclose the cause of action and when it arose. When it arose is directly relatable to Rule 11D which speaks about the suit or the claim being barred by law. Now when we talk about the law, the Law of Limitation Act 1963 will be the relevant law. The period of limitation is as prescribed under the schedule to the Limitation Act as defined under Section 2J of the Limitation Act. And Section 3 provides that every suit instituted after prescribed period shall be dismissed, though limitation may not have been set up as a defense. <coughs> if suit is not covered by any specific article, then it would fall within the residual article. So therefore, the law of limitation is very candid. It leaves no room for much interpretation therein, except for the provisions which follow under the Limitation Act. 
pausing at this uh, stage the law of limitation is actually creating <coughs> a legal framework within which a person can invoke the jurisdiction of a competent court the jurisdiction of the competent court has to be established not only from a perspective of the territorial jurisdiction or the pecuniary jurisdiction but also from a perspective of the law of limitation because law of limitation is a question many a times it could be a mixed question of law and fact but at the same time it can also be a pure question of law as far as admitted facts are concerned so which gives enough room for the trial court or the defendants to go into the question of limitation at the threshold that is when the suit is instituted and the other side is summoned to court the trial court itself in fact many a times ought to in fact examine the plaintiff under order 10 and then see and satisfy itself if the cause of action which is sought to be brought to court is actually genuine or is it a result of clever drafting is a matter of abuse of process for vexatious litigation to harass someone or to probably keep the pot <coughs> boiling for extraneous reasons now as we all know litigation is having multiple uh, 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 what you call as the reasons why they get triggered there are most often they're not genuine cases which come to court because as a society governed by a constitutional law and courts <coughs> we go to courts to remedy our disputes inter se between private individuals and we go to constitutional courts in case there is a remedy against the state now once we accept this proposition now the abuse of process has become so rampant which is clogging the dockets of the trial courts as well as the appellate and the divisional courts including this honorable court now many instances are there where vexatious or frivolous litigation as a result of clever drafting <coughs> are actually passing the muster at the threshold of order 7 rule 1 requirements or rule 11d requirements and there are instances where the honorable supreme court had stepped in and then in fact has highlighted the significance and importance of order 711 as far as the courts and the jurisdiction of the courts to exercise such power is concerned now the earliest and well cited judgment is of 1977 for scc 467 this is t ariv arivindandam versus tv satyapal and another the judgment was authored by justice krishna ayer in his inimicable way i would quote the opening paragraph of the judgment the pathology of litigative addiction ruins the poor of this country and the bar has a role to cure this deleterious tendency of parties to launch frivolous and vexatious cases so therefore the honorable judge actually in the opening paragraph draws the attention of the bar for screening the matters which actually are passing the muster of the lawyers office to reach the courts as an officer of the court then again at the later portion he actually expresses his angst as to how it has spread and then he gives a kind of a, 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 a vision for a judge to deal with such a situation and i quote a judge who succumbs to ex parte pressure to unmerited cases helps devalue the judicial process a very strong words in the opening part of the judgment the honorable judge was actually drawing the attention of the bar to its responsibilities and in the closing paragraph of this judgment the honorable judge in fact goes further and then actually highlights the importance of the judges not to succumb to some kind of an ex parte pressure in unmerited cases is very conscious in choice of words unmerited cases i mean this cannot be cited to say that you are not entitled to ex parte orders there are ex parte orders which are warranted now going forward i mean there are other judgments also where you will statutory limitations etc are cited <coughs> now the next judgment which i would like to bring uh, to the notice of this uh, audience is 2017 13 scc 174 this is madhunuri sri ramachandra murthy versus sayed jalal 
this is a judgment authored by Justice M. Shantana Gaudar. He is no more with us. The Honorable Judge had to deal with a petition seeking rejection of a plaint on the proceedings initiated by the Andhra Pradesh State Vakf Board. So this is a very interesting case where a statutory authority has initiated a proceedings against a private individual invoking its powers. And the private individual takes recourse to Order 7, Rule 11 and then sets out a case for rejection of the plaint by the statutory authority. The broad facts of this case are such that the tribunal has accepted uh, these facts and uh, the facts are that the state work board sets up a case. The procedure under the work fact is that a survey is commissioned under the statute. Subsequent to the survey, the report is submitted to the work board which has to re-verify the claims as to whether a particular property is work for or not and then it recommends to the state government to notify it in the Gazette. That is briefly the process of notifying a work property. Now, in the facts of this case, the case set up by the work board was that the surveyor inadvertently left out a certain portion of lands and therefore they are to be declared as work. In this scenario, the question arose as to when and how can such a case be set up. The case was that the work was initially notified under the earlier act and the subsequent 95 act also, no proceedings were initiated by the work. The lands in question were never notified as a work. But subsequently the proceedings were initiated to declare them as work. In this case, the entire proceedings were actually challenged on the ground that they are barred under limitation because the survey has to be done within a period of a year and if the parties agree to not challenge it and the, within that statutory period, then the proceedings will lapse. Now the question is whether the period of limitation would bar the work board as well. So the Honorable Supreme Court in this very elaborate judgment has actually come out with a very authoritative pronouncement that the land in question once it is not included and gazetted as a land belonging to the Vakf, then the law of limitation as prescribed under the statute itself would bar a fresh claim or in fact it goes further and says a fresh survey also may not be permitted in so far as such land is concerned because it was never there as a part of the original notification or subsequently. Here I quote from para 16 of this judgment. The inquiry contemplated under subsection 3 of section 4 is not merely an informal inquiry, but a formal inquiry to find out at the grassroots level as to whether the property is a work property or not. Thereafter, the work board will once again examine the list sent to it with due application of its mind, and only thereafter the same will be sent to the government for notifying the same in the Gazette. Later portion of that paragraph, it reads, on the contrary, the surveyor's report merges with the Gazette notification published under Section 5 of the work part. This was in the context of a surveyor missing out certain portions, so therefore he can actually start a survey again. So they say that once the statutory process has begun with the surveyor, that surveyor process merges into the Gazette notification, so therefore there is nothing to revisit. <coughs> the findings in, uh, in this regard of Para 17, I read, as held by the tribunal as well as the High Court, the property in question does not find place in the Gazette notification published under Section 5 of the Work Fact. In other words, the property in question is not notified in the official Gazette as work property. If anybody, including the Work Board or the plaintiff, was aggrieved by such non-inclusion of the property in the list notified, the aggrieved person should have raised the dispute under Section 6 within a period of one year from the date of publication of the Gazette notification in the matter. The plaintiff has practically questioned the non-inclusion of the property in the list and the validity of the list notified in the official gazette dated 28-6-1962 after the lapse of about 50 years, that is in the year 2013 by filing the present suit. So therefore, this 50-year period was sought to be actually 
completely overlooked when they approach the tribunal with a petition claiming that there is a mismatch or uh, an inaccuracy in the surveyor's report. So therefore, there was an occasion for the tribunal, the Supreme Court to go and say that the surveyor's report merges into the final gazette notification, leaving no space for any further statutory action once the process had concluded. This judgment actually sets out a case of rejection of plate even by a statutory authority. Merely because the proceedings are initiated by a statutory authority, the powers of the courts under Rule or uh, Rule 11B of Order 7 are very much there and they ought to be exercised in a manner which actually ensures there is no clogging of the dockets of the trial courts with such frivolous and vexatious proceedings. It is vexatious especially when the proceedings are initiated by private individuals or the statutory authorities and in some events we come across governments and district collectors initiating proceedings after decades. In fact, those are the cases where the trial court, as uh, uh, was observed by Justice Krishna here, could actually summon the plaintiff, examine him under Order 10, put questions to him, and then satisfy itself that the plaint and the cause of action that has been brought before it and the relief sought are actually well within the law of limitation which governs this subject. Thereafter, there is a very uh, a detailed analysis on this entire subject by a subsequent and a rather recent judgment of a bench comprising of uh, our former members and honorable judges, Justice L. Nageshwar Rao and Justice Indu Malhotra, in 2020, 7 SEC 366. This is Dahi Ben versus Arvind Bhai Kalyanji Bhansuli. This is a judgment where certain revenue lands which were governed by the special enactments in Maharashtra were the subject of the plaint. Here, the original landowners, having executed registered sale deeds and confirming in the conveyance deed that they have received the complete consideration of more than 1.74 crores, later come to the court and then say that they had not received those uh, amounts which were stated to have been paid by 36 checks which were also referred to in the conveyance deed. So effectively here is a case, <coughs> they come to court and assert that they have not been paid the amounts which have been asserted to have been paid in the course of the transaction before the registration of the sale deed which conveyed the title. Now what they do as a matter of uh, uh, drafting uh, skills of our own uh, fraternity, they camouflage the entire relief and then a subsequent sale deed by the vendor who was the purchaser from the original landowner, the plaintiffs, is challenged and there they set up a complete case which in effect is questioning the earlier conveyance deed. So by way of drafting, they in the relief portion, they choose not to actually challenge certain documents which on the face of it would be barred by law of limitation. Now, this has actually been a case where the Honorable Court had stepped in, concurrent finding, rejecting the, uh, the uh, application under Order 711D was entertained and this frivolous litigation was nipped at the stage of the uh, Order 711 application itself without letting it proceed for the trial. So this is a case where the plaintiff set up that it was a complete bogus case, they were illiterate, they did not know what the transaction was about, they were not aware of the checks which were given. The court goes into the plain government. Now we are conscious that the scope of Order 7 Rule 11 consistently as interpreted by this Honorable Court is that the court when confronted with a challenge to the continuation of the proceedings either on its own or by uh, application moved under order 711D by a defendant is required to look into the plain governments as well as the documents filed along with the plain. So therefore the parameters for exercise of power is very clear and demarcated. Therefore I read order 7 rule 1 where it's a legal mandate to to assert in the plain the cause of action and when it arose. So therefore, 
in spite of all kind of clever drafting, unless those true elements are not there, the plaint will actually be exposed to a challenge of actually suppression of material facts as well. When the relief is sought on certain cause of action which are not really pleaded. So therefore, the framers of CPC clearly have taken care of this aspect by making it mandatory to show the cause of action and when it arose. Now, once that has been stated, the exercise that the court undertakes is a close scrutiny <coughs> of the plaint. Whether the plaint itself on demurrer, as we say, that accepting whatever is ever to be true in the absence of a written statement or any evidence to the contrary does not make out a case of the plaint being filed within the limitation. The court is well within its right to reject it. Similarly, in case there is, as a result of clever drafting, the cause of action and the relief are drafted in such a way that the power is to be exercised only on reading the entire plane and its substance as a whole, not merely by isolatedly reading a few paragraphs. The Supreme Court had very clearly set out here, in this case, the parameters which have to be considered and then gives specific instances by citing the earlier judgment I have referred to of Justice Krishna here and then proceeds to hold that rejection of plaint is actually a, a duty of the court when it is confronted with clever drafting. In fact, in one of the judgments, the courts go to say this extent and say when they are confronted with vexatious litigation as a consequence of clever drafting, the courts will have to wear their judicial activism and then nip them in bud. So that is probably where the judicial activism was required to be brought in to actually nip the litigation at the early, earliest stage so that the entire process of adjudication and dispute resolution in the country is at least lightened by way of cleaning up at the threshold. Therefore, there is a screening which is required to be done at the threshold stage itself. Thereafter, I uh, uh, would like to draw your attention to another judgment which is C.S. Ramaswamy versus V.K. Senthil. This is a judgment by Justice M.R. Shah and Justice Krishna Murari. This is 2022 SEC Online, Supreme Court 1330. So, in this case, again was a classic case where the courts had, were confronted with a frivolous petition. Court here, excuse me, <coughs> was confronted with a case where fraud is asserted. Now, as we know, Section 17 of the Limitation Act excludes the period of fraud from the date when the fraud was discovered. So now, a case is made out on account of fraud to circumvent the XYZ limitation which was facing the plaintiff and therefore an amendment on fraud is brought in to just skip the scrutiny at the threshold, namely that at the stage the trial court is required to issue summons, once they look at the pleadings, oh fraud has been claimed, so then automatically by inadvertence or otherwise the court would feel because fraud is a matter for trial, so the parties will have to be put on notice and then they have to be examined and cross-examined to determine in fact if the assertion of fraud is really made out or not. Here I will read the relevant dates which will be important from the paragraph 28 of the judgment itself. Even considering the evidence and allegations in the plaint only, it can be seen that even according to the plaintiffs, the cause of action for the suit arose on 1999-2005, the date on which the plaintiffs executed the sale deed in favour of the defendant. In para 21, while considering the cause of action, it is further averred 
So the cause of action has arisen on 20th September 1983 when a land acquisition notification was given and then they keep referring to multiple dates. So in para 29 the court observes, from the FOC it can be seen that the most of the cause of actions alleged are much prior to the execution of the registered sale deed. Para 30, even averments and allegations with respect to knowledge of the plaintiff's award in Para 19 can be said to be too vague. Now, the reason I am quoting is the language used by the Honorable Court. Nothing has been mentioned on which date and how the plaintiffs had the knowledge that the document was obtained by fraud and or misrepresentation. It is averred that the alleged fraudulent sale came to the knowledge of the plaintiff only when the plaintiff visited the suit property. Nothing has been mentioned when the plaintiff visited the suit property. It is not understandable how, on visiting the suit property, the plaintiff could have known the contents of the sale deed and the knowledge about the alleged fraudulent sale. Now, here is a case when a person says that I have executed a sale deed or uh, done a transaction and then comes back and later and discovers, no, 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 this is not the document I have executed or the document was obtained by fraud and says that I have visited that place without any specific date, without any specific event as to what happened on that day and how he has discovered. And these are all registered documents which are sought to be get uh, get cancelled uh, by way of a relief eventually. <coughs> Here in para 31, it's interesting to observe. Even the averments and allegations of the plate with respect to fraud are not supported by any further averments and allegations how the fraud has been committed paid. Mere stating in the plate that a fraud has been played is not enough and the allegations of fraud must be specifically averred in the plate. Otherwise, merely by using the word fraud, the plaintiffs would try to get the suits within the limitation, which otherwise may be barred by limitation. Therefore, even if the submission on behalf of the respondents, original plaintiffs, that only the averments and allegations in the plaints are required to be considered at the time of deciding the application under Order 7, Rule 11, CPC is accepted. In that case also, by such vague allegations with respect to the date of knowledge, the plaintiff cannot be permitted to challenge the documents after the period of 10 years by such a clever drafting and using the word fraud. The plaintiffs have tried to bring the suit within the period of limitation invoking section 17 of the Limitation Act. The plaintiffs cannot be permitted to bring the suits within the period of limitation by clever drafting which otherwise is barred by limitation. And then the court proceeds to quote the other judgments on this subject. And then on facts, it rejects the case set up pleading fraud by actually examining the plaint averments and the substance of the averments which clearly show that what they are seeking to do is to get over law of limitation by merely pleading fraud in the plaint. Now I think with this contours of judgments that I have referred to, law of limitation as a question for rejection of plaint is very tricky. It is not an easy path to tread for the reason that at a threshold, you get to net the proceedings and when the proceedings are net, those rights get crystallized. So, one has to be careful and cautious because good lawyering can actually get a legitimate case also knocked off under Order 711B as well. As a frivolous or a vexatious litigation can, can actually pass the muster and then proceed to trial. So, there are two sides to this uh, problem. And it's a very fine balance that the courts sought to have brought about through various judgments by clearly demarcating what can be looked at and what cannot be looked at. So what can be looked at has been very clearly established by reference to the plain governments. The plain governments are the measure on which the proceedings have to be examined when they are looking for rejection of a plaint. Along with that, Order 7 Rule 14 permits filing of or mandates filing of documents on which the plaintiff seeks to rely upon. So the plain documents which are referred to and filed along with the plain under Order 7 Rule 14 are also very much integral part of the plain which can be looked at at that stage to examine if the plain is barred by law of limitation or it is merely a a case set up to delay the trial because Order 711D application, like many other applications, are actually filed in order to protract the litigation. In many cases, 
protracting litigation concerning lands, properties, or partitions, or partition of property, I mean here, not uh, family partitions, between co-owners, etc. What happens is, by delaying the trial, the, uh, the smart or the vexatious litigant is probably ensuring that certain witnesses will not be available to actually come and depose, and therefore eliminating the evidence which can come against them. So, therefore, that is also a mechanism or a device which is adopted by uh, trial and other lawyers to delay the proceedings. Now, it's it's a very uh, 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 game of wits between the parties and their counsels who are trying to actually play a cat, cat and mouse game here to capture the attention of the court and also try to ensure that the proceedings do not go further to ensure it their ends are met and they succeed in what they seek to achieve to begin with, namely trying to get the plaint rejected genuinely because it's part by limitation or to delay the proceedings by keeping those uh, applications pending and then pursuing their remedies. So I think it's, it's a very uh, salutary provision which can be actually looked at seriously at by the trial lawyers especially who actually can insist that the provisions of Order 7, Rule 1, Rule 7, Rule 11 and Rule 14 read together as a scheme can be the stage where they can filter most of the cases and then let only legitimate and genuine litigation pass the muster. Because I find that, uh, in my experience, the Order 711 applications were quite popular in Delhi High Court, where the original jurisdiction is exercised. But I did not find uh, the frequent use of this Order 711 in other high courts or the courts below uh, in other states. Probably because they were not used to it as a matter of practice or they were not entertained. I don't know the reasons because I am not privy to the reasons. But I feel that this measure actually is one thing which can be looked at with its due uh, seriousness to ensure that the proceedings which are commencing and proceeding beyond the summon stage actually are justified and then they deserve to cross the muster. Like we are as lawyers practicing in the Supreme Court familiar with the admission date where the scrutiny is very high. The bar of entry for a specialty petition or a writ petition under Article 32 is very high. Even transfer petitions in non matrimonial <coughs> cases, the bar is very high to actually seek a transfer of a proceedings. So the admission stage scrutiny may have to be a little more rigorous. And then going back to the salutary words of uh, Justice Krishna here, where he categorically holds that this has to be recoursed only then that the frivolous litigants can be kept at bay uh, by again reading out uh, Justice Krishna here, a judge who succumbs to ex parte pressure in unmerited cases, I emphasize the unmerited cases, helps devalue the judiciary. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Sridhar. So much of hard work you made it, so many judgments are uh, enlightened I and mean, brought to our notice. Any question answers, please, I mean, now. Uh, anyone has to, ah, please. Just remove that, remove that. My question is that uh, under Order 7, Rule 10, if somebody wants to file an application, courts have laid that one has to look at the suit and look at the pleadings and the documents that have been produced in the suit. So that seems to be like a limitation on a defendant from looking at or showing to the court anything that they have filed in their written statement or any other document. Do you think this kind of a limitation actually goes against the very whole and soul of a salutary provision like Order 7 Newton? Because doesn't it just cage the ability of the defendant to put across his case? Because as you said, clever drafting is a problem. Sometimes clever drafting can ensure that cause of action is unduly extended. You may rely on a document and give it a meaning which is not there. But you are bound to only look at that pleading. So that's my question. I, I appreciate your concern which is very true. But uh, see, to nip the litigation at that stage, at the threshold stage, 
would actually be a very strong power which is exercised because once a suit is brought to court and then it is rejected, it will have its consequences for all times to come. And this we are concerned with civil rights which could affect properties and other relationships, status, etc. So therefore, it has to be narrowly construed on the basis of the plain governments. See, once you start looking at the defense documents or the written statements, what happens is you are in the realm of adjudication on the basis of rival pleadings or the as prima facie assessment of documents, which is again in a sense of a summary trial. So therefore, that's probably not the purpose of Order 7 as I see it, in the scheme of things. There are other provisions probably one can look at to strike out vexatious pleadings, etc. That may be taken recourse to. Yeah, please. Jyoti, please. Sir, my question is, instead of filing a written statement, if we directly file, if defendant directly file the application for rejection of claim, suppose that application dis, uh, dismissed by the trial court, then uh, he has a right to approach the uh, first appellate court, second appellate and then Supreme Court. Can after the dismissal order of the Supreme Court, again he can uh, ask permission from the trial court for filing a written statement? See, it is very because evident because the <coughs> code itself now is prescribing an outer limit yes. to ensure there is no delay. Yes. So I think it will be prudent that once an order 711 is filed and is rejected and in the absence of any stay of proceedings, invariably we all seek a stay of proceedings once we come in an EPI, even in an SLP before the court. So the proceedings don't go ahead. Then the limitation is frozen. In the absence of any interim order of a competent appellate court, Staying the proceedings, the law of limitation will keep running. But sir, there is only 90 days provision for filing written statements. No, therefore, that is again a salutary pro pro provision to ensure the trial proceeds. I mean, as I said, there is a flip side where uh, people would keep filing applications so the trial doesn't proceed. And the court is engaged only in the applications. So therefore, that, that's, that's the difficulty where a defendant wants to delay the proceedings of a genuine prosecution by the plaintiff. Sir, my second question, what is the basic difference between the application for rejection of plain and written statement? Because all those grounds we have taken in the rejection of plain, we also write in a written, uh, written statement that the all contentions of the plain are false and vexatious and there is no cause of actions and all that. See, I think uh, the, the fundamental difference as I see it is, written statement goes into the pleadings on the merits of the case. Whereas this is only an application drawing the attention of the court to its duty to reject the plaint under the mandate of the procedure court. Namely where order 711D mandates that if it is barred by law, again we read it with section 3 of the limitation act. So even if a defense is not taken, the obligation or the mandate is to the court to reject it. So we are actually drawing the attention of the court to its mandate in that sense. So therefore, it is not a reply on merits because you are not pleading anything new. You are only referring to the plain governments and the documents there. And you would not be actually, if you are actually pleading your case, you are disclosing your plain, your potential defense at that stage, which may not be a good strategy to begin with. If you are successful at the first instance, you don't have to disclose because there's somebody else could come in, in, in valuable properties. So your de your defense is like has to be kept like your some valuable secret. Thank you, sir. Tiwari, you want any question? No, sir. Anyone from the audience? Can you please repeat the citation for this 1977? 1977, yes, sir. 1977, 4SCC, 467. 77, 4SCC, See uh, good questions and answers also. We'll, we'll take your autograph and any message here. Take your autograph. Next. 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 Next.